morning everybody, good morning, it's JPR and welcome back to another video. Honestly, I am as surprised as you are that it took me this long to make a video on Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky. It's no secret that I have quite the soft spot for the Mystery Dungeon series, and I've talked about this franchise in a broader sense in the past, but I've always wanted to hone in on this particular game. There are many reasons why so many people regard this as one of the greatest Pokemon games ever made, even surpassing the core series games in the eyes of many. And I will fully admit, I am one of those people. So allow me to explain the many reasons why I firmly believe that Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky is a masterpiece. But let's clarify a few things before I begin. First of all, spoilers obviously, I'm going to talk about some of the major plot points in the game, so if you haven't played it, please just do it. You won't hurt my feelings if you stop watching now, play the game, and come back later. I promise future me will understand, and future you will thank present you for doing so. And secondly, yes, this also extends to Explorers of Time and Explorers of Darkness as well, since they are basically the exact same game as far as the story goes. The only reason I'm focusing on Sky is because of the extra content, the replayability, and just generally being the definitive version. And third, although I've already thrown around the word masterpiece a bit in this video, please, as always, recognize that these videos are subjective. I know a ton of people who hate the general dungeon crawler gameplay of the series, but even if you are one of those people, I still believe Explorers of Sky is a game that has so much going for it that even people who hate dungeon crawlers for how long and tedious they can be will still find a lot to like about this game. I suppose that the gameplay would be a good place to start though. Like all Mystery Dungeon games, it's very straightforward. You become a Pokemon, you and your partner form an exploration team, and traverse through dozens of randomly generated dungeons, collecting jobs, money, items, and new recruits along the way in a turn-based system. This is the basic premise of all the Mystery Dungeon games, and Sky's gameplay is more or less the exact same as its predecessors, and I'm not labeling that as a bad thing. Again, if you like this, you like this. Some people really enjoy the challenge and uncertainty of exploring these dungeons countless times over, never knowing exactly what will happen. But again, others may find it quite frustrating to sink hours into one dungeon only to accidentally set foot in a monster house, all the Porygon Zs use agility, and then spam discharge until your entire team is nothing but a singed pile of dust and you walk away with almost nothing to show for your efforts. But to me, that's just the nature of the game, and I believe that with enough preparation and quick thinking, you can strategically weasel your way out of most of these unforeseen situations. Most of them. If you steal from Kecleon with no escape plan, you just gotta hold that L, bro. If I had any one gripe with the game, it would be that some of the moves and mechanics are not the most fine-tuned. Obviously, they had to take some creative liberties in transferring mechanics from the core series to fit the dungeon crawler style, and sometimes it just results in a mess. For example, when I first played this game, I got Pikachu on the personality test, which, by the way, the personality test is still one of the coolest parts of Mystery Dungeon, though it's not specific to this game, and I selected Cyndaquil as my partner since it was my favorite starter at the time. Well, Pikachu gets access to the aforementioned agility move, and Cyndaquil gets access to smokescreen. Now, the average Pokemon fan may just think, okay, what's the big deal? It's just agility and smokescreen, two rather underwhelming status moves from the core games. Well, here, accuracy does doesn't really exist in the traditional sense, so instead Smokescreen grants the Whiffer status, which will make the foe miss any attack for 2-6 to six turns. This is also one of the few statuses that works consistently on bosses. So in those 2-6 to six free turns, you can just use agility until you've reached quadruple speed, and then you basically get a dozen free turns against the opponent, which is more than enough to kill nearly anything in your path, including many of the game's most challenging bosses. There are also multi-hit moves like Fury Attack and Rollout that have absurdly high base power, and to balance this they usually have very low accuracy, but if you get hit 5 times anyway, then kiss your entire HP bar goodbye. And of course, moves like Earthquake and Discharge can KO you from across the room with little to no warning. Yeah, if you played this game long enough, you're likely to encounter something that makes you want to chuck your DS into a lake. But man, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't something so gripping about it. Never have I felt so much tension in a turn-based game. If you make one wrong move, all your progress could be wiped out in the blink of an eye. It's frustrating, but at the same time, completely exhilarating. And although all the Mystery Dungeon games fit into this bucket, I'd say Sky is by far the most challenging entry in the series. But the gameplay and mechanics aren't really the main things I want to highlight here, so let's talk about what everyone is really here for. The story. 
I would say every Mystery Dungeon game has a solid enough story, but Only Sky truly stands on its own peak in terms of writing and characters. The Explorers games from the very beginning introduce a lot of mystical elements that weren't a part of the Rescue Team games. The Relic Fragment, the Dimensional Scream, and most notably, the Time Gears, which are being stolen by the mysterious thief, Grovile. In the first half of the game, Grovile is just a shadowy figure who steals the Time Gears with no opposition or no clear motive. But the stakes are raised when the world finds out that Grovile is strong enough to defeat the late Guardians, Yuxi, Mesper, and Azelf, and claim their Time Gears as well, drawing the plant's paralysis ever closer. But eventually, Dusknor is introduced as a solution to the problem, a famous explorer who has come from a future plunged in the darkness with the intent of stopping Grovile. But eventually, this entire storyline gets turned on its head, as it's later revealed that Grovile was the former partner of the protagonist, and that you were collecting the Time Gears in an effort to prevent the collapse of Temporal Tower in the past, an event that caused Dialga to go rogue and eventually stop the flow of time completely. And of course, Dusknor is just an agent sent by Primal Dialga to prevent Grovile from succeeding, because if he does, all the Pokémon from the Future of Darkness will disappear and be overwritten by a new reality. Now, plot twists are nothing specific to Explorers of Sky. The original Rescue Team game had the twist that the player was not the human causing the destruction of the world, instead it was Gengar. Gates to Infinity had the twist that the Muna from your dreams was a villain working with Kyurem, and Hydreigon was on your side all along. And Super had the twist that Nuzleaf was working with Eveltal. But the reason why this twist involving Grovile and Dusknoir is so much more impactful is because it completely changes the course of the game and retroactively answers most of the questions up until this point. Specifically, the question of why the player becomes a Pokémon in the first place is scarcely touched upon in the other Mystery Dungeon games. It usually comes down to, oh, this was your destiny all along, you were meant to save the Pokémon world, and you just don't really question it. But Grovile's plan specifically ties into this odd occurrence, and it's something that would serve as the basis for the post-game story. The post-game is where I knew there was something truly special about this game. No game I have ever played had a post-game story that rivaled that of the main story. Until this. Although Temporal Tower's collapse has been prevented, there is still a disturbance in the fabric of space related to the player character. This brings Palkia into the story, who decides it's better to attack now and ask questions later. Yeah, you'll quickly discover that legendary Pokémon have the collective patience and deductive reasoning skills of a three-year-old in the series. But as more details come to light and the heroes investigate further, Darkrai is eventually forced to reveal himself as the game's true villain. Everything from Temporal Tower's collapse to deceiving Palkia to transforming the player into a Pokémon was all done by Darkrai. It's not Inception levels of deep, but by Pokemon standards, this is a very impressively written story with a lot of twists, turns, and characters that are much deeper than meets the eye. Now, Darkrai is a very comically evil villain. He wants nothing more than to rule over a world of darkness with no grander motivation or backstory, which could certainly be a criticism of the overall game, since he's been the one pulling the strings of the entire plot, but honestly, I don't really care. Between Grovile, Dusknor, and Dialga, the writing of villainous characters in this game is already good enough. The main story of this game is already dedicated to uncovering secrets and motivations of dark characters. Sometimes it's just nice to rally against a character who is evil for the sake of being evil. And at the end of the day, I would still take this as a final boss over a mindless evil snowflake or a mindless evil evil. Darkrai's presence ties all of the game's events together perfectly. He makes the post-game feel more like a sequel than a post-game. Because realistically, there is way, way, way more stuff in this game that's closer to traditional post-game content. This is just an extra story that they didn't really have to do, but chose to do so for no reason other than answering every question possible, and it works beautifully. I also have to commend just how difficult they made this final fight against Darkrai. Not only is Dark Crater one of the most treacherous dungeons in the game, but you have this absolutely worthless sack of expired milk weighing you down in the form of Cresselia. This means even if you continue with the other post-game content and completely overleveled you and your partner, you can still lose easily if you just don't bring enough Reviver Seeds to account for Cresselia. And you can't just tell her to hide out in the back away from trouble, because when Darkrai and his goons surround you, there is no spot that's away from trouble. This game single-handedly made me hate Cresselia until the end of time, but at the same time, I'm impressed that they managed to keep this fight interesting regardless of what level you are. And that's just the late game characters. I haven't even touched on what I believe to be the most important group of characters in this game, Wigglytuff's Guild. Wigglytuff's Guild is one of the best video game families I think anyone could hope to have. You have the dim-witted but comically overpowered Guildmaster Wigglytuff, the strict and annoying but oddly lovable assistant Chatot, 
the peacekeeper Chimeko, the dope with a big dream Bidoof, the excitable but reliable Sunflora, Loudred the Loudmouth, Dugtrio the Gatekeeper, and Krogunk, who is essentially the guild's equivalent of Creed Bratton from The Office, for no reason other than you don't know a ton about him, but you're pretty sure he's up to something illegal. One of Explorers of Sky's main new features was the addition of special episodes, which delves further into the backstories of characters like Wigglytuff, Bidoof, and Sunflora. And of course, we can't forget In the Future of Darkness, which again, is good enough to be its own game centered around Grovile and Dusknoir. These episodes just make you feel that much more attached to these characters. They all have their faults, but they're all incredibly supportive and keep the game interesting even in the early chapters when you're more occupied with exploration and less with the grandiose endgame plot. Of course, it's worth noting that this game is far better paced from beginning to end than its predecessor. While this game makes you slow down and do your fair share of exploration missions in the beginning, similar to Rescue Team, the addition of outlaws learning the ways of the guild and the Fogbound Lake Arc keep you engaged much better. And everything from Duskmore's introduction to the end of the game is marvelous. It's a non-stop surge of rising action. This was one of my biggest gripes with the Rescue Team games, as the other rescuers go off to face Groudon alone, and the game comes to a screeching halt as you're forced to grind side missions until the climax of the game just suddenly arrives. No such pacing issues exist in Explorers of Sky. The end of the game is just one big thrill ride of emotions. Which brings me to my next point, the emotions. Explorers of Sky is an incredibly emotional game that tugs at your heartstrings countless times. But do you know what I consider to be the saddest moment of this entire game? It's not Igglybuff saying goodbye to his master. It's not Grovile's sacrifice to take Duskmoor back to the future. It's not Grovile solemnly looking at the first sunrise in years and what he believes to be his final moments alive. It's not the player's disappearance from the world or the partner's subsequent sadness. To me, it's the guild graduation, which is odd, because the game paints it as a happy moment. You have your own base now, Chatot won't be robbing you of 90% of your pay for missions, no more loudred alarm clocks, this is all a net positive. But to me, it was just sad to not live under the same roof as all those other lovable characters who felt like a genuine family. And it's not even the biggest deal in the world, you only move to the other side of town that takes 10 seconds to run through and then you can see them all again. But it just never felt the same. Now, obviously, you eventually get used to it, and it does end up being beneficial to you down the road. But, I don't know, that moment just hit me harder than anything else. And I think it's a testament to just how important these characters felt, even if most of their impact on the story is pretty negligible, if I'm being honest. Every character in this game feels like a real person. They all remind me of people that I've met in real life. From the fleshed out characters like Grovile and the partner, to the NPCs roaming the streets of Treasure Town with only a handful of dialogue lines. They just go a long way to making this game feel as immersive as it is. And man, I haven't even touched on how great the sprite art looks, from the expressive character portraits to the gorgeous scenery, this is by far one of my favorite games just to look at. Oh, and don't get me started on the music, there is not a single bad track in this entire game. The fights are hype, the dungeons are groovy, the heavy moments are heavy, and the sad themes perfectly punctuate what you're already seeing and feeling. Despite being a game that exclusively features talking Pokemon over people, it is ironically one of the most human-feeling games I've ever played. That reason alone is why I love this game so much. And that's before even considering the immense amount of content present in side events, minigames, missions, and post-game bosses. This game has hundreds and hundreds of hours of content that I have only scratched the surface of in this video. I would genuinely love to see this game remade in the same style as Rescue Team Deluxe one day, with some of the mechanics updated and the overpower strategies toned down a bit. It's such an amazing experience that a whole new generation of fans would get to experience for the first time. I have a lot of faith in Spike Chunsoft after what they showed off last year, I have a hard time seeing any kind of disappointment associated with this. And with all that being said, that's why Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky is one of my favorite games ever made, and at least in my eyes, a masterpiece. Make sure you subscribe if you like this video, we got some more content focusing on Pokemon games new and old coming in the near future. We're almost to 100,000 subscribers, so let's cross that off sometime soon. Thank you for watching, I'll see you guys next time.